You've heard some great talks so far about fat grafting. I'm going to transition over to fillers, but as I said earlier in the introduction, this is going to be a universal, universal talk in terms of aesthetics. Uh, I'm going to first start this talk re uh, about some of the, the key points about fat grafting that, and that I, I want you to take home. Macintosh? I do a lot more fillers and fat grafting now because I can get even more predictability with fillers and almost all my fat grafts uh, I do filler touch-ups on. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about that in just a minute here. So some ideas about fat grafting. One is that fat is bioactive. It's not a bioinert substance. This is not a hyaluronic acid product. And I think it's a very important take-home lesson, especially in the state of Texas where obesity is rampant and uh, weight gain after procedures is, is a problematic issue. So I find that patients that are on a, on a downward slope of losing weight is actually a safer candidate than someone that says I've lost all my weight and I'm ready to do my fat graft now because it's very, very sticky and it stays. And that's my second point, which is fat is permanent. This is a lady that came to me from another state. I do a lot of lip corrections and, and she said, I had silicone injected and I started to operate. I said, no, you've had fat. She goes, oh yeah, I had fat 10 years ago. And I can see that those are fat lobules. And I, I, I've done so many lip corrections, I know what is what. And so this is 10 years out. It's not scar tissue, it is not edema. It is actually viable fat that's been there for, for years because fat is not naturally in a lip. Um, the other point is you've heard that you know, lower eyelid initially, we've had this fear of, of, of that it's gonna be a, a problematic uh, technique. And Mark really taught me a very, very safe way to do this and reproducible. And it's actually quite opposite the way you do a filler with a, a filler cannula. I, you go, you, if you stay deep and you play small aliquots uh, along the, peri along the uh, and release the, the Marcus marginalis there, I think you can get very predictable, safe outcomes. One of the biggest things is fat does take very well in the mid face. And for me, one of the, the, the two areas that you see that just look artificial, and you probably see it when you walk around this con uh, convention center as well, it's the, the lips and the cheeks. They don't balance, and there's something uh, that, that jars with your brain and your mind and when, you, when you see that. Um, I actually don't put any fat in the anterior cheek at all anymore. Everything goes laterally. Around, when I do periorbital fill and lateral fill, I find that the anterior cheek is, is well placed. Now, to Mark's point, I, I agree, it's not just sitting over the malar eminence. It's a very widespread fill, and that aesthetic will be delivered more carefully. When I do, anter I do anterior cheek fills with fillers, but when I do so, I'm always cognizant that this dynamically could be a problem. So when I, I don't have the control with fat, I'll have them sitting up, I'll have them smile as I aliquot drop into the anterior cheek. Because fat, because it takes so well in the anterior cheek, sometimes that proportionality that stays at, at three, six, or nine months starts to evolve, where as aging progresses, especially if they have a lot of sun damage and they, get, they overcome their fat by, by vo ongoing volume loss, the anterior cheek starts to have a disparity with the surrounding face. So I, I fill a lot of outer faces and you'll see why when I talk about the larger aesthetic here. I, I say cut the voodoo, which is, as you heard, quantifiably fat is very hard to measure. Um, and I don't like to just try to fill a tear trough or segment what I do. I've tried PRP, I've tried all different types of things to help improve viability. And I find that fat is still has an unpredictable quality. But as you've heard from two great speakers, when you coat the face, it just makes a magical transformation where the person looks better. And that's the end objective. We don't want to try to worry, is, is a line of face, is, 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 an, is a part of the face um, perfect? Because if you, if you do that, you're going to have dissatisfied patients. I use fillers for that. Fat is a baseline mattress fill. It's like the mattress of a bed. It's the, it's the foundation work for the bed. It's the foundation work for the face. Accordingly, um, I only do one session. So I find that uh, in my hands, what I'm concerned about with multiple fat graft sessions is, is two problems, underfill and overfill, because it, there's some resorption. So if you said the person's not quite happy with the fat, you go back again, well, you may not knock it out because a linear deficit is not easily knocked out with a very soft, um, deeply filled product. When you, a little filler in the office can, can, can take care of it. So as you know the old saying, a difference between an education and an excuse, an education is told before and excuses afterwards. I tell every patient, if you want more flawlessness to your face, which is unachievable to begin with, but an improvement, you need to understand that a office-based product will help you. So everything I do, I say surgery is shooting for an 80% result. 
small things in the office will help me finesse it. And if you try, in the, even a worse risk than underfilling is if you go back and do multiple sessions of fat grafting, you may have an overfilled situation. So either underfill or overfill, rarely are you gonna get a targeted right. So talk to patients about possible touch-ups, and those touch-ups for me are gonna be in the office. And so that is um, using fillers. And so that's, for me, an important thing. And as surgeons, if we're purists, we say, well, we have to do everything surgically. Uh, I believe that. Um, that's just not the case nowadays with advanced uh, modalities that can be done in the office. Uh, and I believe fat is just not good for surface flaws. So a lot of people use fat to try to no, you know, nudge into a nook and cranny and, and fix this little area. <clears throat> My personal philosophy is you're going to have very dissatisfied patients if you try to do that. So I think fillers are the new fat. Uh, I still do fat, but I, it's, it's a lot less. And for me, it's the great person who's just really, really gaunt but has good donor supply. That person is a great candidate for fat. For other people that are younger uh, and with small touch-ups, I, I go to fillers because I think it's, it's a lot easier. And the advent uh, from the larger cannula to the micro-disposable cannula, for me, has been the reason why I've moved uh, toward more fillers because I have the ability and the capacity to do very gentle artistry in the office. Clearly also there's other things such as blood supply um, that, is, is, uh, that cannulas uh, offer, whether it's a micro disposable in the office or a larger one. And if you look, that, that circular volume loss around the eyes, around the mouth, around the face is what we're going to talk about briefly uh, in terms of introducing aesthetic. I'm so focused on this outer perimeter of the face. I think we, we really oversell the front and we undersell the side. The side is how we architecturally view a face from 20 feet away and get an inkling of that person's uh, age from these, these, these uh, confluences of concavities and convexities. And so I like to talk about actually these circles. And if you think about these circles, that is really what I'm focused on. If, if, if you saw my live injection of the night, that's what I'm really focused on. For me, it's like a frame to the face. Um, and that framing is so important. And we go back to that initial photo, you can see that framing element that's there. And then also, uh, as you've heard probably either in my talk or other talks, the, the concept of inverting that shape. So we're, in some examples, we'll talk about inverting that shape, which is important uh, in, in my opinion. You've also heard you know, things about the OG. And I think the OG is important, uh, but in my opinion, it's overrated because uh, it's really the anterior face. When you focus on the anterior face, that is how we interact with each other on a social professional level, and I think that's how we have to view our results. Uh, another trick for you guys that are doing volume, I personally believe that when we use fill flash, we, uh, we blow away our results and you can't see them because in a, in a real life encounter, we're dealing with overhead lights. Right now, when I evaluate you, I'm not evaluating you with a flash. I'm evaluating you with the over down, top down light. Now, too much light creates too much shadow and it's also not good. You have to have a very small room uh, that's white balanced and, and has, uh, you have to play with that lighting to make sure you can show your results. So, um, the, the concept here is filling these zones one, two, and three. We're gonna go a little bit more into detail about filling those zones and that perimeter work, which is really, uh, and not out there because that's where the fatter part of that inverted egg is. And when you're really looking at the zone right here, what you're seeing is this, is a, at the temple juncture, a convexity with two concave patterns. And that little pattern needs to be changed to a relatively confluent convexity. And that, I think, makes a huge impact overall in, in the aesthetic result of someone. So these are the frame elements. We're, we're gonna go into a little bit more detail, some new concepts that I just presented once in Las Vegas, and then filling around the perimeter there. The temple fill, uh, whenever I fill a temple, you always wanna go back to the lateral, uh, go back to the central view, so the frontal view. So I'll fill a little bit of the temple, come back and look at the patient from a frontal view, because that's how we interact. And you can overfill a patient if you're just always from the surgeon's side, which is lateral, right? If you're always lateral, you're not going to see it. So I'm always re-engaging with the patient from a, a frontal view as I fill. Uh, and so that's important. And then just filling the cheek, as you heard, where I'm focused more now is that outer portion. I don't really do too much in this zone anymore. I really focus here, unless someone's truly deflated. I'll start here, see what changes here, and then go here and here. So the, uh, that is the under eye and the anterior cheek. And that's really where I am now, that modification here, one, two, and three. 
from an older idea. So again, I have the slide one more time. I'm, I'm really wary of the anterior cheek. You can always come back and fill it, but I feel that the support of the outside is so, so important. So let's talk about frame of the eye. A new concept that I've come up with this year is rethinking those circles as triangles, asymmetric triangles. And I believe, if I can advance this here. Julian, can you help me advance this? I'm not sure why it's not going forward. Oh, and we're done. Now, so the, as, the, as the slide come up, comes up here, I, I want to talk about the triangulization. Is, what happened over back there? Is it jammed? All right, so as it comes back up, the, the, the circle can be refined with a concept of two asymmetric triangles. Essentially what that is, it's a, uh, perfect. Okay, so the initial circle, I like to talk about this asymmetric triangle, where you have a shorter limb medially, uh, focused uh, on the apex where that superorbital notch is, and then a longer lateral limb, and the exact opposite, a longer medial limb and a shorter lateral limb. So when I start to fill now, whether it's a fat graft or a filler, I start with this position. Now here's the reason why. If we start to look at this as brow descent, where there is this, this totic outer brow, it's really what it is oftentimes that can be masked is this notch. When I fill this notch, this changes the angle to be more, instead of a triangle, into a horizontal shape. So I'll fill this little notch, look at it, fill a little bit more laterally if I need to. And a lot of times, in 90% of the cases, I fill that and we're done. But if I fill a bit here, fill a bit here, and fill a bit here, I, I inch going out this way. On the bottom side, besides just filling this tear trough we're so focused on, we have to look at the lateral canthus and sometimes this little hollow here, and then you, you sometimes have this residual apex. So I'll come back and fill here just so that you can un, uh, you can sort of knock out that, that component there where it looks like a triangle so that the eye is better framed where this has been dropped down. Now I filled the whole brow here, including the lateral recess, but I filled this and now you don't see the, the, the verticality or the triangulization of the eye. So these are just the ideas that I showed in terms of entry points. Uh, uh, yes, I did. That's Botox, too. Everyone gets a little Botox. Magic sauce. So this is filling here, filling up, and then I come back from the same point oftentimes, but no big deal if I fill more. These are, again, points, and this is just that extra little fill if I need to come back and touch it up a little bit more. And these are, uh, with, these are again, talking about how I enter with a cannula, not with fat, because fat goes vertical uh, and perpendicular to the rim rather than parallel. And this idea that um, DeMaio from Brazil came up with, I think is genius, is and I'm really focused on filling this outer portion first. If the person has, has a budget for me to do more work out here to structure the face instead of just going straight to the orbital rim with fillers, I'm going to start filling the zone because I really believe it starts to lift the entire face and create support. So I'm killing two birds with one stone. I'm first structurally improving the outer face, creating a better arc of, con uh, of a confluent convexity and I'm supporting the lower eyelid and supporting the anterior cheek. I don't go to the anterior cheek uh, with a filler until I've supported the outer face. So the outer face always takes a priority and then I come back and fill it. So this is really an amazing thing. I angle with my, my cannula about 45 degrees toward the periosteum. I don't go obviously under the periosteum, but I go toward the periosteum below muscle and start to push and lift that zone up before I continue. And uh, that is how I basically support that outer, outer area and start to improve that zone. And this is just framing the mouth, which the concept you heard from Mark already, which is a little bit about this anterior uh, submental depression, but it's this whole zone. It really is every from, everything from the labial ment uh, mental sulcus, the pregial sulcus, this whole confluence. I used to call it an upside down U, but I think it's actually much more universal in that whole zone that needs to be done. And this, if I have enough product, I'll go to it. If not, I'll usually skip it. If, and if, I, if I have a choice, I'll just work on the canine area. Um, I liken it to remodeling a house. So when I figure out what the patient's budget is in terms of fillers, I will then work to put a little bit in, see if my right brain says that's attractive enough. If it is, I move on. If it's, you know what, they need more, they're still not looking good enough, I stay there. I, hit, I mentally go through priorities. And those priorities, so if I have four syringes to fill, I'm gonna start working with the first one, seeing where I can go with that, and I mentally plan the whole thing. So I start to fill, so example would be, let's say these are all the highlights and contours I wanna work on. And then, so what I would do is I'm gonna determine how am I gonna fill these zones? 
and I hit priority zones and that my eye constantly engages if, if I'm running out of product to do it. So these may be the zones of priorities and I'm gonna, if I have one syringe, I may just fill this much of each of those. If I have two syringes, I'm gonna go to there. If I have three, and this is the art. So same thing I encourage you is when you look at a pan facial fill with fat, same thing with a filler. Don't just fill a fold, don't fill a cheek. Look a little bit here, use your right brain, look at the frontal view, is it more attractive? Go to the next shadow. Is that shadow good enough? Well, do I have enough product? And I'm constantly gauging how many, with the number of syringes that have been allocated to me, what can I design? So I work backwards from a budgetary constraint and design the face accordingly. And that's basically just conceptually how I, I plan it. And I believe everything is asymptotic. So in other words, I am never going to get to perfection. And I tell a patient that on the front end because people say in the past, you know, you've filled my lower eyelid four times and I still have a little line there. And so now I, I tell every patient, you're, I'm not going to face everything. I'm just going to improve. Um, I say I take two steps back and one, two steps forward and one step back, no matter what modality I use. I use, I like this vibration device. I don't have any affiliation with the company. I, no no uh, disclosure whatsoever for anything. And it allows me to get very far into the zone um, to, to uh, vibrate in that area and still be far away with the uh, assistant's hand. Uh, the assistant's holding this, not me. And then I like this other um, product. Again, I, I don't have any affiliation with them. Uh, I spray every patient with this. And really, the, the CEO told me within a second, it kills all the viruses, funguses, and, and bacteria. So I wipe them down with chlorhexidine that I spray them, it can, it's safe in the eye, safe in the mouth, and then uh, you don't even have to let it dry, you can start working. So just some very quick examples, we're finishing, we're running out of time. This is uh, my assistant just reshaping the face, ovalizing it, I like the word oval, so we're ovalizing the face. This is a little heavier jowl, so I've restructured it. Obviously framing the eye and the mouth. Sorry, she has a little bit more makeup, she was on a new show with me, but this is taking a square face and ovalizing it, framing the eyes. This is taking a square face and ovalizing it. And this is all just done with fillers. This is 37 on, 36 on the left and 42 on the right. This is ongoing filling, just reshaping the oval. And this is the one you saw before, 49 years old. This is taking a face that's had an overdone brow lift. And, and, and this is 53 on the left, 60 on the right. And this is ongoing filling to re-sculpture re the face to make it top heavy instead of bottom heavy. So I always encourage um, everyone that I, I lecture to, to to really seriously consider not just filling for the sake of filling, but engaging your artistic side to see what is worthwhile. Thank you. Thank you.